Welcome to Beulah, and thank you for joining us today with Pastor Brian and Beulah's worship team. Good morning, friends, and on behalf of our Beulah Church family, we wish you a happy Easter. Today, much like Christmas, is the, one of the greatest days that we celebrate because the grave is empty, Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, and we have the promise of life and the hope for a great future. This is the day we celebrate and invite you to celebrate it with us because God, since the beginning of time, had orchestrated his plan to take on flesh, to live sinlessly, to die sacrificially, and our place on the cross to pay the penalty of our sins and to die and be laid in a grave and to be risen victoriously, to be raised from the dead victoriously so that you and I could have the old part of our life gone and our life be made new in him, that we could have hope, that we could know what love and joy Joy and peace is all about that we could experience grace and mercy so that we could be his children. Today, we want to encourage you to celebrate that with us. And so as we sing, as we share in baptisms, as we glorify God as engaging in his word and responding to him in faith, we want to encourage you to be a part of that. So today, whether you're watching, uh, whether you're on campus, whether you're watching online, on YouTube, or uh, on our website, BeulahChurch.com, or you may even be listening on the radio at 92.9 uh, or 5.50 a.m. at WAME, we want to say thank you for trusting us with this time of worship. We have much to celebrate so we want to encourage you to invite somebody right now to celebrate with us. Take the link from the YouTube channel or text your friend and say, hey, join in on the radio or meet me at the front steps of the church at either 8, 9.30, or 11, and let's worship together because he is risen. Come on, won't you pray with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to do extraordinary things today through this, this time that we have. Would you let us be able to celebrate you as, Lord, we sing of old and new, and as we tell the old story from the heavenly perspective, God, that you did everything necessary on the cross for it to be done, for it to be complete, for it to be finished. And, Lord, we can't wait for that day. So, God, I pray that as we engage in worship today, would you stir in our heart a steadfastness that we would stay faithful to you. And, Father, for those who don't yet know you as Lord and Savior, would you stir in their heart today a reason for repentance? And Father, grant them that. Allow them to come to their senses and acknowledge the truth. Escape the trap of the devil and experience the goodness of the risen Lord in their life. Lord Jesus, would you do a great work among us today? And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Come on, invite a friend. Let's worship together. There is a blood that cost a life that paid my way. This 
that try to hide in this precious blood that gave me
Of God in helpless pain, 
this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on the cross as Jesus died the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the love of God get into the word. Father, we celebrate you tonight because you are the only one worthy of praise. We thank you, Lord Jesus, because of what you did on the cross 2,000 years ago. We can have life and hope and, Lord, everything that's before us. And, Lord, we know that this is all temporary. Matter of fact, as we're going to study tonight, we're going to see that heaven and earth are going to get remodeled one day when you return. And so, God, what we're begging for tonight is that you would open up the word and let us, dear Heavenly Father, see your glory and your renown, that it would cause our hearts to thrive in you. It would cause our, uh, Lord, just a longevity of our faith. And, dear Heavenly Father, that we could be sustained, that, dear Lord, we would want you more than anything else in our heart and in our mind to be glorified, Father, so that, so that in our lives until the day you say, that's it, it is done, that we would be faithful, that we would be soul winners, dear Heavenly Father, that we could be exactly who you want us to be. And Lord Jesus, I'm asking you to do your work now. And if there's one here who does not know you as their Savior and Lord, that Father, they could be born again. That, dear Heavenly Father, they could be drawn to you. That, Lord Jesus, you would grant repentance, allow them to escape the trap of the devil. Lord, come to their senses and honor you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen and amen. Y'all ready to get to business tonight? You ready? How many of you, let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever been on an uh, all-inclusive vacation? 
Any, anybody ever been on one? You went on a cruise, you went on one of these. My wife and I had an opportunity to go on one when we got married almost 18 years ago this year. And um, it was a part of our honeymoon, and, and our, it, it was our honeymoon destination to Ocho Rios, Jamaica. I'll never forget it. And we, in planning up to it, we had all kinds of... Uh, we had all kinds of brochures and information. I mean, they, they, they capture you by the picture, don't they? I mean, man, wouldn't it be nice to just wake up and eat your breakfast out there? They, 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 they sell the location to you. They, uh, they let you see the peaceful scenery and, and get you all excited about that. They tell you about the food. I mean, for a big boy, talking about food, I mean, that's, come on, all-inclusive. I mean, I, that's the thing I asked the travel agent. I said, you mean to tell me I can go get something to eat any time of the day I want to? They said, yes. I said, now I'm not talking about continental breakfast. We're, we're paying big, big money. I'm talking about if I want a piece of grilled chicken, can I get a piece of grilled chicken at 2 a.m. in the morning? They said, yes, we have a place that's open. I said, if I want some of that good fruit pineapple, just plates of it, that I can get that too. They said, yes, all inclusive. I said, so that means I'm not gonna have to get up there and dish up, a, dish up some more money. They said, no, and tips are already included. I mean, they, they really sell you the package. They talk about the attractions that you can go here and you can hike there. And I'm thinking, I'm on vacation. Well, I don't want to do any of that, but you can go snorkeling and scuba diving and swim with sharks. And I'm thinking, man, I'm like a big piece of beef jerky. I am not about to swim with a shark, you know. And, and what they tell you is leave the old behind for a little while but, and experience something new. Honestly, what they do is they, they pretty much sell it to you like heaven, don't they? They, uh, they, they want you to experience it in a way, go forward with me guys, <laughs> they, thank you. They want you to experience it in a way to where it's like heaven on earth. They're, 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 they're giving you the goods. It's, but it's a high priced vacation for a short amount of time, isn't it? It's a high price that you pay for just temporary accommodations. And when I think about that, that's what makes me so excited about Easter. You see, Easter weekend, uh, we're gonna close this, the book on the book of Revelation. We have been in it since, uh, I forget how long we've been in the book of Revelation, but, but this now is where we're going to close the book, and, and, and it's all going to be wrapped around what Jesus did on the cross 2,000 years ago because he paid the highest price, and, and he paid that price to give you a permanent residence. He paid that high price to give you the ultimate access to God and he paid that high price to give you a new identity in him. And he paid the price to give you a place to be forever. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 21. If you don't have the scripture, we'll have it on the screen for you. And I know the guys are going to be working between bouncing back and forth so you can see my face and the screen. So if we get some blunders and it goes to camera left and looking at the baptistry, we'll just chuckle with us and and we'll be ready to roll. So let's hear the word of the Lord and the promise of what Jesus did, is doing for us. The Bible reads, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, what has led us up to here at this moment is as, we, uh, as we've seen the Battle of Armageddon and then the millennial reign of Christ, as we come out of that, it's the great white throne judgment. Now, the Bible tells us that, that when we began the book of Revelation and John saw heaven, heaven was loud. The choirs or the heavenly angels were singing and, 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 and we've joked all throughout the book of, of Revelation, some of us going to have a hard time. In, in heaven. Why? Because they sing the same song over and over. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, who is, who is to come, who reigns forever and ever. Amen. Right? That's what the 24 elders do. They sing. And it's loud. You got to remember in heaven, there's no, uh, there's no sound waves in heaven. So it's perfect sound. So all of us who like loud stuff, or we like really good, uh, we like really good sound systems that have that perfect sound, we're going to love heaven. Why? Because it's crystal clear. It's going to speak to where it not just hits our ears, it's going to hit our souls and our hearts. But here, the great white throne judgment, the throne stands by itself. And the Bible says that heaven and earth fled away from the throne. 
This is where God sits in his glory and he judges rightly and all that is in heaven and that is on earth that has ever been touched by taint or corruption or sin cannot stand in front of him. This is where he will judge us by the deeds we have done and he will open the books and if our names are not written in the Lamb's book of life, we will be assigned into the fiery lake that burns with sulfur and fire and the Bible says that's the second death. And so now, John says, as I'm in heaven, I see a new heaven and a new earth. Uh, straight off the bat, that the first, th first things first, if you will, that as the throne stands alone, heaven and earth get a remodel. <laughs> Come on. They get a remodel. Now, you say there wasn't anything wrong with it to begin with. God thinks so. And he creates a new heaven and a new earth. And, and they're coming down. Why? Because the first order of things had passed away. The first heaven, the first earth, they could not stand under the pure judgment of God. And he says that the sea was no more. Now, if you've followed us in our study, whether online or, or on campus, when the, the sea is that deep reservoir of evil. And now, after the millennial reign and the great white throne judgment, the sea is no more. That deep reservoir of evil, that uh, intentional obstacle to all that glorifies God is gone. It's absolutely gone. It has been removed from its place. Isn't that awesome, friends? Isn't that good? And so in the power of this, then John says, and I saw the new Jerusalem. This is the old and creep, creeping in on the new. They have a template. They know what heaven and earth looks like. And the people of faith are the new Jerusalem. This is that city that you don't have to worry about overpopulation. It is, bit, it is built squared for everyone who belongs there. He sees it coming down like a bride prepared for her, for her groom. Now, men who are married, how many of you remember your wedding day? Come on, do you remember that? Do you remember when your bride rolled out when it was her time to come down the aisle? Does anybody, anybody remember that? Woo, I remember when Miss Angie Navy rolled out in uh, August the 2nd of 2003. Horse-drawn carriage, 100 degrees outside, big boy, sweating. I'm just, I still feel sorry for whoever had to clean my tuxedo after that wedding and all the dancing that we, that we did. And I'll never forget her stepping out of there out of that carriage and seeing her, and it was Angie, but it was, it was like never before. It was at this moment that I knew this was the commitment that I was making for a lifetime. It carried with itself a whole different level of expectations and celebrations. And John says, when he, and, and, and what it really meant to see her is like, oh, it's serious now, right? It's super serious. Don't y'all like to watch the, the videos, the America's Funniest Home videos where, where it's at the wedding time and the groom locks his knees and about the time the, the bride shows up, my man just goes shell, pow, just, just falls over. Well, what John is communicating to us here is this isn't, as we've known, the last trumpet sound, this is getting serious. Everything that God has promised to us through Jesus Christ is becoming a reality. Amen? You with me, church? So what happens in verse 3? He says, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is where? Is with man. And he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. Now what I love about this passage, church, is this. Is here, God is always getting to us no matter how hard we try. He's the one that gets to us. You and I can't get to him. He has to get to us. Isn't that good? Isn't that powerful to think about it? See, this is what separates Christianity from every other world religion. Every other world religion is what mankind, humanity, is trying to do to get to God, but Christianity is what God did through his son Jesus Christ to get to you and me. And he was serious about it in creation. He spoke the world into existence. And in the pinnacle of creation, he created Adam and Eve, right? As, as humanity sinned and fell away from him, he was still insistent to be with them, to be near them, to deliver them, to raise up uh, leaders like Abraham and Moses, to give them judges, to give them prophets, to give them, even though they, they, he said, you don't want a king, and they desired a king, he even gave them a king. 
And though all of that in their sacrificial system, mankind is still trying to get to God until God finally says that I'm going to get to you and I'm going to get it over with. And he took on flesh and came to this world and lived in this world sinlessly, died sacrificially and rose victoriously. He's serious about getting to us. And he did that on that cross so that we could have a stalwart, stable place in him. Amen? Not a temporary stay, but a permanent stay. Paid at a high cost. And here's the power of this. He is getting to us. And what I love about this is he says, I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people. You know what that encourages me is it means there's no more obstacles to your relationship with God. How many of you have struggled? You don't have to raise your hand, but think about this. How many of you have struggled with obstacles in your walk with the Lord? Come on. It it ranges. Some of us have struggled with unbelief. Some of us have struggled with a, uh, with a lack of faith. Some of us have had real sinful weaknesses in our lives that we have battled with and battled with and battled with and struggled to where they hurt our faith. Some of us have had bad, bad experiences at church, right? Had bad experiences and somehow or another that weakened our faith and we thought, well, if they're just going to be like that, well, well, well I'm just not even going to go. Here's the moment where God says, I'm coming to you again, And I'm going to be your God, and you're going to be my people, and there's going to be no more obstacles in your faith. Isn't that good? Now, if you're sitting here and you say, I've never had an obstacle in my faith, and I want you to check yourself to see if you're in the faith, because I want to make sure that you're not uh, over here thinking you're doing your bidding and just letting Jesus in when it's convenient. There's a huge obstacle. You're deceived. Jesus is either Lord of all, or he's what? Not Lord at all. Y'all can talk in the new sanctuary too. It's, it's okay. I, I, I like it when you, when you talk back. The, the best part I love about this that he says, I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people. I don't ever have to worry if he really exists. You ever been in a season of life to where you wondered if he was paying attention? You ever said some prayers that when you got up and specifically if it's somebody, I, I know some of my friends, we, we, pray, we pray for some of our loved ones because they, they go through real situations and, and we pray in faith, but we still see our loved ones go through struggles. And it's kind of one of those moments where you look up at the corner of the eye and go, are you paying attention to me? You ever been there? Well, this is that moment, guys, where we're wondering if he really exists is over. And this is that moment where no unanswered que- there are no more unanswered questions about his will for your life. Isn't that good? How many of you have had that moment where you have struggled? Here you are on the, on the edge of, of trying to make a decision, right? That's been the thing. Everybody said, don't fall off, Pastor, and don't fall in the baptistry, okay? All right? I think more people have been more interested in people falling in than actually going in for real reasons, okay? So... So here's the point. You ever been in that moment where you're really struggling? Should I retire now? Should I do this? Should we do that? Should we go back now? Or should we wait a while? What should we do with our kids? This has pushed us to a new season of where we're at. This is that moment where you no longer have to worry about God's exact will for your life. He says it. You're going to be mine and I'm going to be yours. That's what our faith is working toward. Amen? Amen. Our faith is going to become sight. Now watch verse 4 as first order of business in the new heaven and the new earth. I love this one, Terry. Woo! This burns me up, bro. Listen to what he says to us. He says, verse 4, he will wipe away. Come on, church. Read this with me. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have what? Passed away. Just look at that for a second. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Who normally wipes another human's tears away? Normally a parent to a what? To a child, right? What's God telling us here? I've told you I would be your father all along. That, that's how close he's, he's going to get to us. Come on. This isn't some kind of backstage pass here that you got to have if your lottery comes up and, and, and you make it in. And it, it, Listen, if you give your life to Christ, <laughs> you won the lottery. Let me just tell you, okay? This is where God's saying, I'm going to get so close to you that every tear you've ever cried, I'm going to wipe away. 
Can you imagine those nail-pierced hands just caressing your face? Woo! With them holes still in them. Come on, as the symbol of what he did for you and taking his old thumbs and just wiping away those tears. He, he says that I'm going to wipe your tears away in conjunction with the fact that death shall be no more. See, heaven already knows that death creates struggle. Heaven is already aware that death is hurtful and it comes with a, a level of heaviness in life that, that sometimes the best way to describe it is that emotional response in crying. Many of us have experienced that. We've either seen in this last year loved ones pass because of COVID or friends or people in our community. We have, many of us have prayed more than one prayer for our friends and even some of the members of this church that have been, uh, that have either been in the hospital or at home because of this or because of other, uh, other issues. At the beginning of COVID last year, guys, I did, uh, I think it was 16 funerals in a matter of about seven weeks. I literally <laughs> would go to work, come to the office here and go, Lord, please don't call anybody else home. Don't call anybody else home. And in those uh, back after back after back funerals, I, I could see this. I know it in my heart, but you get to see it. It, it hurts. And in one of the first order of things, he says, I'm going to wipe every tear from the eyes. And one of the things how I'm going to wipe it is what? Death's going to be no more. And if death is no more, guys, that means the presence of sin isn't anymore. Because why? The wages of sin is what? Death. So as he eradicates death, sin is also eradicated. There are, this is where we know that God is interested in our life. He says that there's no more mourning. There's no more crying. There's no more pain. There's no, uh, pain's going to be no more. The former things have what? Passed away. There are at least nine elements in the new heaven and the new earth that are eradicated because of what Jesus did on the cross. That we're going to see it that the sea is no more. Evil can't stand against you. Death is no more. Sin is no more. Do you realize that when sin is no more, then shame is no more? Come on. You have made the connection that Jesus not only died for your sins, but he died for your shame too. Some of my good friends, believers, some folks that I've been able to counsel uh, over the last four years at this church know Jesus loves them. They just can't ever get over the shame of the past. Listen, the same gospel that saves you is the same gospel that can sustain you. The same gospel that wiped away your sin is the same gospel that can wipe away your shame and say, look, I'm not looking for you to be better. I'm looking for you to abide in me. And as you abide in him, he washes shame away. How much more affection and love. See, he let every deficit in him happen in his hands and his feet and his body, as Isaiah says, that he was beat unrecognizably so that he could wash away your shame. Shame with shame comes grief. And he says there'll be no more grief. There'll be no more crying. There'll be no more pain. I can't wait for the day that pain when men and women, boys and girls who are trying to learn one another and relate to one another but have been blocked by either color, creed, nation, or whatever it may be, that will be gone one day. And all God's people said, because that pain cannot stand in the presence of God. Everything that is under God's control, that has been under his wrath, will be no more, and night will be no more. I wish somebody would have told me that when I was a six-year-old scaredy cat of the dark, having to go feed my dog out at late at night, out in the country where it's so dark you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. Had I, somebody just told me, Jeff, this passage in Revelation 21, had someone just, I'd have quoted it all the way out and all the way back, and night will be no more. But no, little fat Brian out there, booty booty, run just as fast as I could. But night will be no more. And listen as the scripture goes forward. Are you guys still with me? Listen as what the Bible tells us in verse five. He says, and he who is seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things what? What did he say? I, the one who is seated on the throne and making all things what? New. Behold, he says. Also, he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, read it, church, it 
is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. The old emerges into the new, the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem. Jesus says it is done. And, and what ended on the cross as it is finished, translated into heaven, that it is done. That the plan of God has been worked out. And what ended here and it, it, it is finished began in heaven as it is done. Now watch these last verses and this promise that God gives us. It's a promise of an inheritance, but it also is a promise of destruction. To know that you and I could have the opportunity to enter into where God says, I'm going to remove every obstacle. I'm going to be yours. You're going to be mine. Everything you've ever wondered about, I'm going to handle. This is a promise to us, but it's also a warning. Listen to what the Bible tells us. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. He says to the one who is thirsty, the one who wants what I have, the one who wants this land where mourning and pain and sin and sorrow and shame and guilt and death can, is no more. The one who is thirsty for that, he says, I'm going to give you this inheritance. It's yours. And I'm going to give it to you to drink. I'm going to give it to you without what? Requiring any payment. Why? Because the price was paid on the old rugged cross 2,000 years ago. But listen to the warning of the promise of destruction. There's a promise of inheritance but there's a promise of destruction. He says, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, this cowardly, faithless, and detestable would go back to the five of the seven churches that couldn't get it together and let all kind of manner of evil, grievances, complain and gripe and, and unfaithfulness happen in their church. This speaks to them. Those who were too cowardly, that they would not stand consistent in their faith. Those who grew to a faithlessness. Those who did detestable things or taught detestable things. And then he says, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur. This is the second death. Now friends, straight out of the gate, which one sounds more appealing? To be where God is, to have that well of living water without payment, <laughs> no funds required, redeemed, I got this. Tabs on me, he says. Or to be bound so much in your sin. See what he's, it, it, this isn't just a criticism, he's speaking of characters. Not a character in a cartoon, he's speaking of a character that emerges in your behavior. Would we be so deceived that we would want destruction rather than to be where he's at? And this is it. This is the end. This is the warning for you and for me. Remember, John's revelation is an apocalypse that it pulls the screen back and lets us see there really is more going on than what meets the eyes. It is a prophetic word which gives warning that judgment has come and that you and I are to get our lives right, we're to repent so that we don't miss the inheritance, the promise of a great inheritance. And it is also a letter to encourage us to be mindful of the life that we should live. So you say, Pastor Brian, what do we do with this? How do we close this up? I think we close it up like we began it. Because he is making all things new and we know that the book of Revelation is redemptive in its nature, which means it, it does it, it's not seeking to count your sins against you. It wants to provide you a way to be right. The final part of this book really does start with the cross. Let me try to help us understand it. You know, we began the sermon talking about a, a, a vacation package, right? Uh, some of us have uh, even taken our stimuluses and gone places that we've never, <laughs> never even dreamed about being, right? So it's a vacation package. It's a temporary stay with a super high price. You know, you don't have to go on vacation for that. You can, uh, you can rent. That's what we always counsel our young couples together. As soon as, you, as soon as you can figure out how not to rent, we encourage them to what? Don't rent, but what? Buy a house, Rent is just a high price uh, paid for a temporary location. 
We encourage them to buy a house and to purchase a home. And when you purchase that home, you get a permanent address then, don't you? One of the things that they want you to do immediately is they want you to get a mailbox, don't they? That mailbox does something very specific. It, uh, it, it shows your permanent address. It, it identifies you, right? So how do you start putting in a mailbox? Anybody ever put one in? You got to start with a hole, right? You got to dig the hole. Get your sack creed out there, why? So all the knuckleheads who were like me that were unredeemed and going by trying to knock it over, right? You get your sack creed out, and then you just, get, you just get that pole, right? You put the pole down, you tamp it around. But is, is that a mailbox? Huh? No, no, no. It's just simply what? It's just a post in the ground. When, is it, when does the game change for this? When you put that box on top of it, don't you? And the mailbox makes it complete. The mailbox, when you put the box on the post, now we're talking. We're, now I can identify you. Now I know where you live and, 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 and you got little numbers on there that identify you. Now, since the box is on the post, you can start receiving things, right? Amen? You get some junk mail in there, but you can get some good stuff in there. You can get the fruit of your labor. You can get some, some, uh, some letters, some encouragement, some birthday cards, things like that. Y'all still do sell, send snail mail, don't you? I, I hope it's not all digital. That's what I'm talking about. But at that point, you know that you've paid a high price for a, what we would call a permanent stay. Amen? It's, some people would say, oh, we just love this. This is our what? Forever home. We've worked so hard, this is our forever home. You know, I think sometimes when we look at the cross, I got a feeling that when we look at this cross, sometimes we just look at it as that post in the ground. Now, now we can identify that, in, at least in, in, in America, that this is a religious symbol, right? We can identify that... Uh, it is, uh, it, it is the sign and the symbol for Christianity. In America, we could, if you've been to any kind of history class, you may even realize that, hey, this is the symbol of, uh, pers or, or, of persecution to Christians. You may even be able to go back and say, hey, this was, a, uh, this was an, an instrument of execution. But what I wonder about, guys, is, is really how we look at the cross. Is it at Easter just a symbol of punishment? Is it a high price that you're not interested in any kind of payment on? Or do you realize that it's something bigger? Because to tell you the truth, if it's just there by itself and I'm just looking at it and living my life and trying to live in the shadow of it, then that's all it is, is two sticks put together. Much like that post before I put the mailbox on top of it. But when you put Jesus on that cross, that's what changes everything. Amen? See, that's when I can identify who he is and who I am. That's when I can identify what I did and how tragic it is to the glory of God. See, without him there, anybody could have died on it. But when Jesus went to that cross, it made everything in Revelation 21 true. That the old order of things is going to pass away. And they started passing away when he took the first slash on his back. Matter of fact, it started passing away when he took on flesh. Matter of fact, it started out because John said, I looked him in the center of the throne, was a lamb as though it had been what? Slain before the foundation of the world. This has always been in God's economy. It's been, always been in its plan. See, it's just two sticks until you hang Jesus on it. And then for the believer, it becomes the greatest identifier of my life. Amen? Have you found that to be true for you, Christian? When you hang Jesus on it, it is the way like that mailbox that I receive salvation. When you put Jesus on that cross, it overcomes, he overcomes every power of the old order. Think about it. We already talked about it. This the reservoir of evil will be no more. And you say, well, Pastor Brian, I feel evil every day. I sense it. I get discouraged by it. The Bible would tell us, hide behind the cross. That is the guard post that kept us from God. But when we surrender to him, it is now the fence post that keeps us safe from the world. It is there that, 
death is no more. Jesus said in John 17, or, or John 11, excuse me, he said of, of Lazarus, he said what? I am the resurrection and the life. No one comes to the, or excuse me, I am the resurrection and the life. Though he be dead, yet shall he what? Yet shall he live. This is where sin is destroyed. This is where shame can be let go of. This is where we can receive healing and grief. This is where our tears can be dried up. This is where, thank God, our pain can end one day because he endured pain for us. This is where every evil that stands against me is defeated and this cross is the lamppost of my life that though weeping may endure for a season, what? Joy comes in the morning. See, this is the highest price paid to give me a permanent stay. Have you let him pay that price for you? The old order is gone. And when he said it is finished 2,000 years ago, it translates to the end of time. It is done. God gives for you and I the greatest invitation to say, you don't need a, you don't need a high price vacation. You need a high price permanent stay for eternity. And I paid it for you. And all God's people said, amen. Father, this word really needs no explanation. And I pray, Father, that I have done it justice, Lord, and not muddied it. I thank you, dear Heavenly Father, that we can trust you, that we can hope in you, that there is no one greater than you, and there's nothing that, Lord, we should ever desire apart from you. But dear Heavenly Father, now in this moment, we want to honor you. We want to give you glory. We, dear Heavenly Father, want to celebrate in a way that, Lord, only you can help us celebrate. Now today, if you're here and you've never given your life to Christ and you've seen through the baptism, you've seen through what we've sent, sung, and you've seen this cross, is this the moment where you say, Pastor Brian, I need to give my life to Jesus. I've never given my heart to him, never surrendered my life to him, and I wanna know that I know that I have a high-priced, high permanent residency because he shed his blood on the cross. If that's you today, and you wanna give your life to Christ, then I want you to borrow my words. And let's do what the Bible says. The Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So if that's you today, would you just simply borrow my words and say, Jesus, I realize my need for you. I have sinned against you. And as we've read this word, I realize that I have the tendency and the probability to spend an inheritance of destruction. Lord, I want an inheritance where you are my God and I can be your child. So I turn from my sins and I ask you to forgive me I ask you to come into my life. I ask you to save me. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. Rescue me. If you're here today and you've given your life to Jesus, here's what I want to ask you to do. I want to ask you before this service is up today, I want you to come to me and say, Pastor Brian, I just gave my life to Christ. What next? We want to talk to you about baptism. We want to talk to you about church membership. We want to talk to you about your walk so that you can stay consistent. So Lord, now as we enter into this time of Lord's Supper, would you bless this endeavor? Would you meet us here? And Father, would you honor yourself? And it's in Jesus' name that we pray and all God's people said, amen and amen. If you identified with today's message and are encouraged by it, we want to hear from you. Our email address is worship at Beulah, SVL, Dot com. For all our resources, visit us at BeulahChurch.com. You may also contribute to this ministry on our website under the Give tab. Please join us again next week. May the Lord bless you greatly.